The, this morning we're going to take a look at two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. These two fellows lived right after the time of the Babylonian captivity. So going back two weeks ago, we covered Daniel and we studied the period of the Babylonian captivity. And then last week with Pastor Nolting, you should have covered the book of Ezekiel, which was also during the Babylonian captivity. We're moving to what's called the, if you, somebody remember this from, or, or asked about this in the, the brief summary, but, yes I do. Anybody else need a copy of these books? I might not have enough for... Thank you. Thank you. I'll have to get you another one. Did you ask for one? I've got, I've got a couple more, I just don't have them in here. Uh, these, these little booklets are just kind of a simple overview, a short paragraph overview of each one of the books of, of the Bible as a summary. So we're going to be taking a look at the post-exilic prophets now. The exilic is the exile. And so, does anybody remember what year the exile began in? You've got to go back two weeks. 605 B.C. was the first of the exiles. That was the one that Daniel was taken in. And remember, there was a period of three exiles over the next 20 years where Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem, defeated Jerusalem, and then took captives out of it. So 605 is, is the date where the, the exile typically began. And, well, I'll tell you what. Let's begin with prayer, and then we'll come back, and we'll take a look at a couple of other uh, references as we begin. We bow our heads. Dear Lord Jesus, we come before you today and ask for your blessing upon our work which you have entrusted to us as we proclaim your name and your kingdom to those around us. Encourage us as you did your people through the prophet Haggai, reminding us that your work is never in vain when it is done for you and to your glory. Encourage us in spite of the difficulties that we face in this life and remind us that you are the source of our strength and that all that is done in your name is valuable. We ask that you would bless our study here this morning to the glory of your name. In your name we pray. Amen. Let me, let's back up just a little bit this morning. Uh, let's back up to the prophet Isaiah. Uh, can somebody read Isaiah chapter 39 verse 6. Let's start there. Isaiah was a pre-exilic prophet. In other words, he was one of the prophets that spoke to the children of Israel before the Babylonian captivity. And it's pretty amazing to see what the Lord prophesies through Isaiah. Uh, somebody have that reference? Isaiah chapter 39, verse 6. Behold, the days are coming when all this is in your house, and your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. So here's Isaiah. Now, Isaiah was prophesying at about 700 B.C. So a hundred years before the Babylonian captivity took place. And what does Isaiah say by inspiration? He says, a day is coming... When all of the things that you have accumulated are going to be carried off to Babylon. Now, that would have been a, a strange thing to hear at 700 B.C. because the Babylonians really weren't even on the scene. They were a tiny little group. They were not powerful at all. The people of Israel would have laughed at such a concept in, in the 700s. So, Isaiah says, this day is coming and your stuff is going to be carried off. You're not going to have it. You're going to go into captivity. Now we jump ahead a little bit to the prophet Jeremiah. We covered Jeremiah uh, during the summer, and he was just at the time of the beginning of the captivity. So he was around in 605 BC as the Babylonian captivity was starting to take place. And then he was, his ministry continued into the Babylonian captivity. Let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10. Jeremiah 29, verse 10. Did somebody want to read that verse? For thus says the Lord, after seven years are completed in Babylon, I will visit the 
visit you and perform my good word for you and cause you to return to this place. What is Jeremiah saying? And that's a pretty amazing prophecy, isn't it? He gives... Now remember, Jeremiah is hanging around here right after the Babylonian captivity takes place. He's in the early 600s where he's prophesying to the children of Israel. For those of you who were with us during the summer, Jeremiah had a pretty rough life. He was tasked with speaking the gospel and speaking God's message of judgment to the final kings of Israel. And there were many times that he was thrown into pit. He was thrown into a prison because the king didn't like the message that Jeremiah was bringing from the Lord. You're going to be judged. Your kingdom is going to be lost. You're going to be defeated. That kind of thing. And so every time that he brought a bad message, they'd throw him into prison. So he had a pretty rough life. He made it through the end, the last king of, of Judah. And then they put a governor that was over the people. His name was Gedaliah. And that went pretty well until the people killed Gedaliah. And Nebuchadnezzar then comes from Babylon. He says, you killed my governor. You're in big trouble. And then he took more captives off to Babylon. At that point, Jeremiah was hauled off to Israel against his will by the people of Judah who were afraid of what was going to happen because of what they had done to Nebuchadnezzar's uh, governor. And so he then continued to prophesy from Egypt. And it was while he was there that he spoke these words. 70 years. Let's go 70 years ahead. <laughs> What do we get to? From, from 605, go ahead, 70 years? 535. What is it? 535. 535. Now, for those of you who are thinking about Ron's math, uh, he is good at math, but you remember, you've got to go backwards. We're at BC, we're trying to get to zero, so 70 years in the future, you get to 5, it's actually 536, your math was right but 536 was the date when Cyrus comes on the scene. And Cyrus was mentioned specifically by Isaiah back in 700 BC. He actually names Cyrus by name. He says, a guy's going to rise up. His name is going to be Cyrus, and he's going to send the people back to, their promise, to the promised land by name. 200 years in advance, Isaiah says, this is the guy's name who's going to send you back. So in 536 BC, the children of Israel then have the, the, the uh, privilege of returning back to the promised land under the permission of the king of the world, Cyrus, who was the ruler of the Medes and the Persians. He says, I want you to go back. I want you to resettle your land. Now, here's the thing. They've been in captivity for 70 years. Remember, the cream of the crop were the ones that were taken out of Israel and settled in Babylon. And it was the, the misfits that were left in Israel. The temple had been destroyed. The city had been destroyed. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Let's say when you were young, somebody took you into captivity, marched you halfway across the country and resettled you against your will. You didn't want to go. That was your, that was your homeland. You were 16 years old. 70 years later, how old are you? 86. 86. Okay, 86 years old, 70 years later, some ruler steps up and says, hey, you know what? I like you guys. You can go back to your homeland if you want. How many people do you think are going to want to go back? How many people do you think are going to want to pack up their belongings at 86 years of age and start to rebuild all over again. A lot of the people that moved out west in the early part of our country, they weren't, they weren't 86ers. They weren't 70ers. You know, they were, they were in their 30s, some were in their 20s. There might have been some in their 40s, but it was that younger generation. They said, we'll go back. Now, there were some. There were some that said, yeah, we want to go back because that promise of God is important to us. But it was a very small number. And as they returned, it was not an easy task. They had to rebuild everything from the ground up. Emily? The, the ones that the were, couldn't have been very many that remembered back then. No, there, there probably would not have been. Yeah, because, I mean, look how, look how old Jeremiah was. 
And he was just a kid when he went over there. Right. So. Same thing with Daniel. Yeah. Uh, you know, Daniel yeah. made it through all of those different uh, succeeding uh, empires that conquered one after another. He was a very, very old man yeah. when he got to that point. And so we kind of have to keep this in the back of our mind. And yet that's not the worst of it. The, this, this group of people now, they've been, they've been given the opportunity to return to their homeland. And even though a lot of the people were older, many of them didn't even remember that, they had passed on the importance of the promise, even in exile. We have a couple of psalms in the Old Testament that are called exile psalms that are, are hymns that were sung during the period of the exile. They're very encouraging and they do speak about the promise of God about the Messiah even during their exile. So there were some that picked up everything that they had and they moved back. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be introduced to some of these names. The first one that we're going to talk about is the prophet Haggai. Yep. Who lived in their homeland while they were gone? Uh, there were some of the Jews that were left over, but some of the, and it was basically just the Jews, it was just pretty much empty. The Babylonians were different than the Assyrians. The Assyrians would actually take groups and they would, they would shuffle them and move them all over the place. So that happened to the nation of Israel where there were foreigners that then were settled in the land of Israel to the north. But the Babylonians didn't do that as much, so it was just a little bit more empty. They just wanted, Nebuchadnezzar was so upset, he gave them three opportunities. It's kind of like three strikes, you're out. You know, he came in, he said, I want you guys to listen to me, I want you to be my, my uh, vassals. And they didn't listen, so he took exiles away. And he, you know, he says, okay, I'll give you another chance. And they didn't listen, so he took another group of exiles away. So it was all done. Basically, everything was destroyed, but it was a very small population that was left over. It was pretty much in, in ruins. Uh, in the land of, of Judah to the south. So there wasn't much left. There might have been a few people that came and settled there, but again, you know, if you're, if you're going through a war-torn area and you have, you, you, know, you have no connection to that area, the last thing you want to do is stop and rebuild right there, right? So there, there wasn't really a draw for people to come in and rebuild until 70 years later when Cyrus says, okay, now you can go back. And uh, um, basically the only reason that the Jews went back is because they were holding on to God's promise that he would send the Savior. And we had the prophet Micah earlier who said that Savior would come out of the land of Israel from the city of Bethlehem. Those promises of God were tied to the land. And that was the reason that a lot of them did go back. It was holding on to the promises of God. Jolene? I was often wondering, why did they, why did they want to carry these people into their country? I mean, they surely would have, would have had enough people in their own country. That's a good question. Uh, it wasn't so much that they wanted to take them to their own country, now, although there were aspects of that. For example, they took Daniel and his friends, the ones that showed a lot of talent and ability. They said, hey, we want to we incorporate these into our, our country and use their gifts for the benefit of our society. But... But the main reason, yeah, we do that still today. We talk, you know, think about doctors that come from other countries and people have different gifts, so we still do that. But the main reason that they did it was because when this whole group was together, they got together and they rebelled. So if, if this group right here is the nation of, of Judah and I'm Nebuchadnezzar, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to separate you guys and I'm going to move some over there and some over here and that way you don't rebel you know, there's less likelihood of you rising up and rebelling against my authority. So that was the main reason. And they started with the cream of the crop and then they would work to the next group of, of artisans and, and people that had skills, but they kept removing people from the society until finally there was, there was basically nothing left. So, so Haggai is the first prophet that's on, on the scene and, and a couple of years later, two years later, we get into the prophet Zechariah. These two guys are pretty different. Haggai is a short book. It's only two chapters long. Zechariah is a longer book and he has a lot of, of visions. Uh, it's very much like the book of Revelation. The, in fact, the book of Revelation is based in a large part on some of the visions that are seen in Zechariah. But Haggai is just a little bit after 536. The people have returned. They've started to, to give their offerings for the, for the rebuilding of the of the, the town and the temple. But what happens is as they're sent back and they start the process of rebuilding, the foreign nations around, it's just like today, 
The foreign nations around don't like Christianity. They don't like its intolerant message. And so they say, hey, we don't want this temple rebuilt again. We've, we were glad to get rid of it. And so the people actually rebelled against the, 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 the nation of Israel, the nation of Judah. They, they then sent messages to the king and they said, we want them to stop building this temple. And it was enforced by law after a while. After, after Cyrus passed away, a new king rose and they stopped then. They were forced to stop the construction of the temple. Now, put yourself in the shoes of the children of Israel, the captives who have now returned. It's a tough job to begin with, and now you're confronted with the enemies, and they basically shut down the operation. How do you feel? You want to pack back up and move back to Babylon again? Probably not. But at the same time, you don't want to stay where you are. It's, it's frustrating. And it was here at this point that the Lord raises up Haggai. The people were discouraged, they were frustrated, they were, they were just completely without any hope at all. And God says, I'm going to fix that. And Haggai is a really, really encouraging book. It is, it's, like I said, it's only two chapters long. There are four different messages in the book of Haggai. You'll get four different sermons. And one of the neat things about the book of Haggai is throughout the book, it actually tells us exactly when the messages were spoken to the day when Haggai was speaking these messages. So let's start with verse 1, Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. If there is one New Testament verse that sort of summarizes the book of Haggai, it would probably be Matthew 6.33. Does anybody know what Matthew 6.33 is? Some of you can probably sing it. Yes, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So that's kind of the summary of Haggai's message. He says, if you put God first, everything else will fall into place. The people were discouraged, but he says, hey, we put God in His proper place. He's going to bless the results. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So let's start with Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. Somebody want to read the first verse? Oh, come on. There are no tough names. Well, okay, there's a couple. Somebody looked ahead. Uh, I'll try. All right, Ron. The second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Shealtiel, governor of Judah, I got that one, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, saying. Okay, so we're introduced to a couple of important names. We don't like those big names that are hard to pronounce, but they're really important. So we get a couple of different guys. We've got Haggai, he's the prophet, Zerubbabel, is the what? What's his role? Governor. He's the governor. And then you get Joshua. What's Joshua's role? High priest. He's the high priest. So you've got a prophet, a priest, and a governor. Not king, but a governor. So all different, three different areas, and all three of these guys are going to play a very, very important role. They're going to work together. Joshua, Zerubbabel, and Haggai are working together to encourage the people in this very frustrating situation that they're in. If you were to summarize Haggai's message, it would probably be with the words that we find down in verse 7. Let's jump down to verse 7. Volunteer to read this. This is an easy one. No, no tough names in this verse. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give King careful thought to your ways. Okay, what translation do you have, Sally? NIV. NIV, okay. Uh, anybody have a different translation? King James says consider your ways. Okay, consider your ways. It's a similar idea. Give careful thought to your ways. Consider your ways. I like the consider just because it's shorter. Uh, it's a short, short little theme. Consider your ways. This is going to be repeated by Haggai in each one of the sermons that he preaches. Consider your ways. Now think about how important that, that 
request is, that encouragement is, consider your ways. Think back to our passage from earlier, Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. How are you doing with that? Consider your ways. Give careful thought to what you are doing, what you are thinking, what you are planning. Consider your ways. Let's go on. Verse 6, Sally. Verse 6. Uh, verse, yeah, let me, let's back up. Yeah, uh, sorry, I should have started with verse 5. Verse 5 is the first consider your ways. Uh, verse 6. Okay. <clears throat> you have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not worn. You earn wages, only to put them in your purse with holes in it. All right, who can relate to that? <clears throat> Everybody, right? Isn't that the way that just life kind of seems to be? Think about that again. You've sown much. you put a lot of seed in the ground. Boy, this relates to this year, huh? But harvest little. Uh, there were some farmers this year that planted three or four times, and they're still not going to get anything to come up. Uh, some of the stuff's rotten on, on, the, on the vine. Consider your ways. You have sown much, but harvest little. You eat, but you're not satisfied. You don't have enough to eat. He says you drink, but you don't have enough to, become, uh, to get rid of your thirst. You put on clothing, but what's the problem? You can never be warm enough. And you, you get money, you receive your wages, just to stick them in your pocket and it has holes in it. I mean, how applicable is this? And what does the Lord then say? Again, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And then he says in verse 8, Go up to the mountains and bring wood and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. You see what the problem was? The people of of Judah, who had been returned to the promised land, had become discouraged. They'd been only thinking about themselves. They weren't dedicated to the Lord. They weren't trusting the Lord. He says, hey, yeah, people are standing against you. But that temple is important. That's where I am. That is where I will be glorified. Continue to do that work. Go up to the mountain and build the temple, the Lord says. So consider your ways. He says, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with you. I'm going to bless you. Let's go down to verse 10. Uh, Sally, do you want to go on there? Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their due, and the earth is its crops. You know, who's in control of everything? Yeah. Now, if we're going hungry, if we don't have enough to, to drink, if we've got holes in our clothes... Now, we have to be careful about blaming God because the result, many times God's, God comes into our lives and He uses those things in order to bring us back to Him. We have to be careful that we don't shake the finger at somebody who's going through something like that and say, oh, God must be really punishing you like Job's friends, did you, Job? Because we don't know the heart of God. We don't know what is going on. But the Lord reminds us in our own lives, ask yourself, Am I putting things in their right place? Consider your ways, Haggai says. And this is just as applicable to us today as it was 2,500 years ago. He says, consider your ways. Where, where are things, how are things going in your life? Are you putting the Lord first in your life? He says, that's, that's what we should be doing. So, it's kind of an interesting thing. You know, think about that. Uh, the people have a, a bag they're putting all this stuff in their bag and there's a hole in the bottom. And a lot of times that's the way it feels in our lives too, doesn't it? You know, we continue to build up all of this stuff in life and there's, it's not lasting. It might last us during this life. We might not even realize it's got a hole in the bottom because we think we can build it all up for this life and we might even have it when, we're, when we're, the Lord takes us home. But the Lord says, this is not what's most important. Go up to the mountain and build my temple, the Lord says. Put me first. We're taken back to the first commandment. I am the Lord your God. There is none like 
me, none in all the earth. So that's Haggai's first message, the call to rebuild the temple. This is a message of law. He was reminding the people what they hadn't been doing, what they needed to be doing. Uh, let's go on down to the, the second message, chapter 2. We're told that on the 21st of the seventh month, so again we have a very specific date, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. He says, Speak to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? Now, the, inter the verses in between tell us that after the Lord had said, Hey, go up, start building the temple, the people had followed. They had done that. They had started to rebuild the temple. But they're scrounging anything that they possibly can. And they're working on rebuilding the temple. And as this temple is going up, the people who were here 70 years earlier, they were in their youth, the older people who had returned, they look at that temple. Remember, the temple of Solomon was the one that was destroyed. Do you remember how the temple of Solomon was described in the Old Testament? I mean, it had, it had cedar that David had, had stored up from, uh, from Lebanon. They were covered with gold. There were beautiful images. And the people are looking at this and saying, Oh, this is horrible. The Lord says, Look at this house. Who among you remembers what the former temple was like? And how does this one compare? The answer to that question is what? Doesn't. It doesn't compare. This is nothing like the temple of Solomon. Do you think that was a little bit discouraging? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you could probably even compare that to the history here at Grace. For those of you who were around at the time of the split. When you left St. John's, purchased a church up on Highway 4. That didn't really compare, did it? You buy a piece of property and you build another building here and... You know, it's not as nice as the nice brick building of St. John's. It's been around there for a long time. And you look at this and the Lord says, so how does it compare? And the answer is, well, it doesn't. And that seems to be a discouraging message, but let's go on. Verse 4. Somebody take verse 4. It now be, so, be strong, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong. Strong Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord. And work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, this now is an encouragement. The Lord says, hey, don't worry about what the building looks like. The building isn't what's important, is it? It doesn't matter what the building is or what it looks like. Now, we don't want to get to the point where we think, oh, you know, we can just throw a bunch of pieces together and, and that's God's house. Because Malachi is going to deal with that later on. He's going to say, hey, you know, don't bring the worst of your offerings and say that's good enough. Remember, the, the message here is consider your ways. What is it coming from? If it's coming from the heart, it might not be the prettiest thing. But if it's coming from the heart and God is the first thing in our lives, then it's the prettiest thing God's ever seen. It's like that soothing aroma that Noah offered after the flood. Uh, that's what God wants to see. That's what he wants to hear. Uh, we go down, though, a little bit further. He says, don't fear. And I love this. Verse 7. He says that the day is coming when I will shake the nations and they will come out of the, well, you have the desire of all nations and I will fill this house with glory. The Lord says, this house might not look like much, but there's a day of coming when the desire of the nations will come and I will fill this house with glory. Do you know what he's talking about? Jesus. Yeah. He says, this house doesn't look like much, but there's going to be something inside this house proclaimed from this house. The Savior is going to come and he's going to be one of the, those that, that, is, that is there in this house. That's what is going to be the most important. And then he says, hey, Verse 8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. And in this place I shall give peace. When we were in Atlanta for the 12 years that I served down there, 
we worshipped in three different rental facilities. It was just in a business district. It was a storefront. And I remember about eight years into my ministry there when we, another CLC congregation uh, sent out an email and they said, hey, we've got some extra pews. Does anybody want it? Before that, we had just used folding chairs in, in the sanctuary. And everybody said, oh, we got pews in here? It actually looks like church inside this building. But that wasn't what was most important, was it? It didn't matter what the pews looked like. It didn't matter what the building looked like on the outside. What mattered is what was proclaimed in that building. Christ and Him crucified. We don't have to have a church that looks like St. Mary's. No, I've had, I've had people that have told me that it's beautiful in there. I still haven't been inside in the two years that I've been here, but I've heard it's just gorgeous. I've been in a lot of places up in the cities, but that's not what's most important. And sometimes that can actually detract from the message too, can't it? The Lord says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. I like to come back to this passage when I have a conversation with people about the lottery. Now, I've, I've got a thing that I like to tell people when I'm at the gas station and somebody in front of me is paying for gas and they say, hey, can I have one of those uh, you know, little lottos or whatever it is? And they pull it off and I'm standing behind them. I say, it's not worth it. And they turn around with a strange look on their face like, what are you talking about? I say, it's not worth it. You know what they usually tell me? I know. <laughs> you know. Now, sometimes you'll have people say, well, maybe this is the way, you know, God's going to give me this $30,000 and I can give, you know, half of it to the church. No, half of it's going to go to the government. So that's only good. you're not going to get any. But here's the thing. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord. If the Lord wants you to have that $30,000 or $300,000 or $3 million, does he need the lottery of Minnesota to give it to you? Absolutely not. It goes right back to what the Lord says right here. Consider your ways. Do we trust in the Lord? Do we put Him first? Seek first the Lord and His righteousness and all these things will be given to you? Consider your ways, says the Lord. It doesn't matter what the building looks like. The Lord says it's the message that is proclaimed. It is Christ who makes the building what it is. And in this place, I shall give peace. Imagine the comfort. You know, the people, they were given, they were putting their heart into that building and it still wasn't what they wanted it to be. But God says, it's okay. You put your heart into it. That's what matters. He says, the silver is mine, the gold is mine. If I wanted to have that thing, solid gold, I could do it. Couldn't he? He motivates us through what Christ has done for us. We're not motivated by saying, hey, you know, if I do this for God, maybe he'll, he'll bless me back. No, we're motivated. God, we love because God first loved us. When we understand what Christ has done for us as the desire of the nations, as the sacrifice for our sins, we are motivated to give back to God out of what he has blessed us with. Yeah, maybe we do still have holes in our bags. But we understand that's okay. Because what we have, it isn't in the bag, right? What we have, what God has really blessed us with, He has put right here. Not in the bag that we carry throughout our life. That stuff doesn't matter. We have something that will never run out. Any thoughts? First two, uh, two messages of Haggai. I see the word peace. You know, you see that word peace, there's two meanings. One is inner contentment. The other is like to be peace in the world. The peace you see a lot in the Bible is contentment all over the place. New Testament, Old Testament, and he's always giving us peace. He wants us to be just content. Yeah, um, and, and even maybe even a deeper, a deeper than that, the actual concept behind the, the word peace is a, a reconciliation between us and God. You know, if you think about having a, a bad relationship with somebody, and it does carry over into our, our relationships in life or, you know, uh, between nations, you have that concept of peace, we're at peace with one another. But whatever has been, we've been separated, whatever has caused us to be separated, has been put away. And in the context of the biblical application of peace, that's sin. Why, why do we have peace? 
We have peace with God. We have that contentment knowing that our sin has been removed. And that is a very comforting concept, isn't it? To know that the, the relationship that we had with God that we ruined has been set right by Christ. But that's an important thing to keep in mind, that idea of contentment. It's not just this worldly concept of peace. It's a, it's a deeper concept of peace. Any other thoughts? Did you ever get anybody to say, mind your own business? No, I haven't. <laughs> Seriously? No, I haven't. But I haven't walked up behind you. <laughs> you know, it, but I think people really understand that. I think they under, they're, they're, part of their conscience is working already, and they say, yeah, I shouldn't be buying it, but, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, it's just kind of a sad thing. So, you know, you can use that. Uh, next time you're at the gas station, you see somebody buy it, say, it's not worth it. Gets you into a conversation. And like I said, I've never had anybody say, mind your own business. So if you, if you get one of those, Ron, let me know. A friend of mine gave me $15 worth for my birthday. Scratch off. Not a penny. Yep. Yep. See? It's not worth it. <laughs> you proved my point. You know, talking about the way the temple looked when we built this church, the other side called it a sheep shed. Mm -hmm. And I thought, of course it's a sheep shed. Yep. We're the sheep. Jesus is here. What We're better place to feed? Yeah, yeah. What a better name to give it. Yeah. Maybe that's what they meant. Yep. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'd rather don't. <laughs> Uh, let's go down a little bit further. Um, in the last chapter, the last section, we, in chapter 2, verses 10 to 19, we get the third message. He comes back a little bit to the law in those verses. We're at the 24th day of the ninth month, so two months have passed, and he's, he's back at it again. Uh, again, Haggai brings a little bit of a message of the law. He says, your heart isn't in it. Uh, you know, I've given you this comfort, but some of the people weren't doing it for the right reasons. Let's go down to verse 14. I volunteer to read for, verse 14. Then Haggai answered and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclear. Ooh. That's not so good, is it? This is what Jesus condemned in the lives of the Pharisees. The fact that they were going through the motions and doing all the things that they were supposed to do outwardly. But he says what they were offering was unclean. It kind of reminds us of the difference between Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel both brought offerings before the Lord, but we're told that Abel's offering was accepted by the Lord, while Cain's was not. And the reason for that was because it wasn't coming from Cain's heart. Abel was giving willingly the first fruits. Cain was giving what he was supposed to be giving, but not out of a heart that was responding to God in, in love and thankfulness for what God had done for him. So he says, we still, we still have a problem here. They are doing the work of their hands, but what they are offering there is unclean. So we go on to verse 15. Notice we have that theme coming up again. But now, do consider this from this day forward, before one stone was placed on another in the temple of the Lord. From that time, when one came to a grain heap of 20 measures, there would only be 10. When one came to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there would only be 20. The Lord says, hey, we can go back to where we started. It all is about where God is in your life. So some of the people had been motivated. They'd been motivated to go up to the mountain and rebuild the temple, but it still wasn't coming from the heart. It was still just going through the motions, not really trusting in God to do what God wanted them to do. And so again, Haggai comes forward and he says, hey, just because you're doing the right thing outwardly doesn't mean that it's what God wants. God is not pleased with those things. Uh, think about Psalm 51. We have this in one of the parts of our, our liturgy. The create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You know, God is not, He's not just happy with us going through the motions. A broken and a contrite heart, O Lord, you will not despise. Uh, that's where it starts, is on the inside 
not on the outside. A lot of people are, you know, if you use the law, the law is effective. It really is. You can use the law and you can get people to do what you want them to do. But the law doesn't change the heart. Only the gospel changes the heart. The gospel gets us to realize what God has done for us and it motivates us through the Holy Spirit to do what we should do out of love for God. So that's why a lot of these religions, and I'm not just talking about Christian religions, there are a lot of Christian religions that love to emphasize the law, beat people over the head with the law. The foreign religions of the world, they're all law-oriented, and it produces results, but it doesn't change the heart. And Haggai comes back and he says, here's the problem, but remember, he's using the gospel in order to direct people to the, to the important message. Then you get down to the last, uh, if you go down to the last verse in that section, verse 19, uh, you go back to the heart again, and the Lord says that he's going to change the heart, yet from this day forward I will bless you. Uh, there's the gospel where it comes in. He says, I'm going to give. I'm going to give to you. Even if you don't give to me and you're not doing it for the right reasons, I don't stop giving to you. God continues to bless us, both the believer and the unbeliever. He pours out his blessings upon them. He wants our salvation. The last message is verses 20 to 23, and it's the focus on Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is, who is Zerubbabel? The He's the governor. At the same time, Zerubbabel is a picture of Jesus. This is pretty neat. Zerubbabel was a forefather, an ancestor of Jesus. Did you know that? Uh, if you go to Matthew or Luke, either one of the two genealogies in those two Gospels, one is the genealogy of Joseph, the other one is the genealogy of Mary, depending on whether you were a Jew or a Gentile. <laughs> Both of them trace their lineage back to Zerubbabel as a forefather of Jesus. And so here you have a picture. Zerubbabel is the governor, and he uses Zerubbabel as a picture of the coming Savior. We get a, a couple of verses in this section where it talks about the um, overthrow. Let's go down to verse 22. Somebody want to read verse 22? And I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the east. And I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them. And the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. Okay, and then in verse 23, he goes on, he says, I will make you my signet ring. Is that what uh, you have in your translation? At the end of verse 23? Yeah. For I have chosen you. Uh, Zerubbabel would be a picture of Jesus. And if you think about this, the deliverance that God is speaking of and proclaiming here was not a physical deliverance but a spiritual deliverance that would come about through Zerubbabel. Remember the thing that was important to the children of Israel, what brought them back to the promised land was the promise of the Savior that God was going to bring about. And so here, through using Zerubbabel as the picture, God says, I'm going to bring about that Savior. Here's the one through whom that Savior will come. I am going to continue to fulfill my promise. That, again, going back to what Rita said, to bring about that peace between God and man. They wanted peace with the nations. That was important. But more importantly was the peace that God brings between a just God and sinful human beings through the sacrifice of Jesus. Any thoughts on Haggai? He says a lot in two chapters. He does. And, and there are four, four messages that are still applicable to us today. That's what's amazing to me about the prophets of the Old Testament. People say, ah, who wants to read those prophets in the Old Testament? Uh, they're so old. They don't have anything to do with us. It all dealt with the nation of Israel. No, it deals with the church, which was Israel at that time, but that's us today. And the message that the prophets gave to the church of the Old Testament is just as applicable to the church today in so many ways. I bet you never knew that the Old Testament talked about lottery tickets. But it's there, isn't it? Some of the naysayers against the Bible uh, don't talk about the accuracies of some of these, you know, uh, predictions. Right. I mean, it's amazing. One of my favorites is the book of Daniel. We didn't get into that two weeks ago, but boy, there are some very specific 
historical prophecies that were made by Daniel that, that demonstrate the fact that only God could give this information. You know, there, there are guys around here that will, they, they continue to make predictions. And they get some of them pretty accurately, but it's only like, you know, 10% of all the prophecies that they make that they actually get accurately. And here's the Lord, who every one of the prophecies that he makes, he gets accurately. It's not just 10%, uh, it's, it's 100%. And, and that demonstrates the reliability of, of God's Word. Any other thoughts? Uh, Nick, Zechariah is a heavier book. It is more apocalyptic. It's a little bit tougher to get through. We'll take a little bit more time going through some of those uh, visions of the Old Testament. If you are interested and you're reading along as we're going, I would encourage you to maybe read the first six chapters of the book of Ezra. Because Ezra lays out the historical situation behind Haggai, Zechariah, Zerubbabel, Joshua. Uh, it goes, he backs up a little bit before his time. We're going to take Ezra in a couple of weeks. But he lays out some of the historical groundwork that's important in, in the history behind Haggai and Zechariah. So that might be, we covered a little bit of it this morning, but it might be helpful to get the bigger picture. So if you're interested, you could take a look at he, um, Ezra's first six chapters for next week. Any other thoughts before we close? Like they say, nothing is new in the world. Nope, no, there's nothing new under the sun. Keep making the same mistakes over and over. And, over. And, over. and God's blessings don't change either. Exactly. Uh, the sinfulness of man hasn't changed and the, and the blessing of God has not changed either, the promise of God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.